Grace and peace to you in the name of Christ. Good morning and welcome to morning worship with the Katona Presbyterian Church. We welcome our friends in the sanctuary and all of our friends who are watching with us online. Today is the Martin Luther King Sunday and we are thrilled to have as our guest George Williamson. George and Carol have been worshiping with us for several months now. George is a retired pastor, college professor, and chaplain, and his roots in the civil rights movement go back to February of 1960. And I think he'll tell us more about that in a bit, but welcome, George. We are so thrilled to have you with us this morning and are looking forward to the word that you'll bring. Also by tradition on this Sunday, we usually have the community-wide interfaith Martin Luther King service at Antioch Baptist Church. This year, out of concern for COVID, that service will be entirely online. But if you go to the Antioch Church Facebook page, you can go to facebook.com and then the slash, then it's all spelled out, the Antioch Church NY. And I don't know precisely when that service will drop, but it should be posted on their Facebook page later today. And you could probably also find it on the Antioch Church website. And so I hope you'll take advantage uh, in participating in that service when you can. God has called us to worship. I invite us to join in the call to worship. Friends online, you can say this responsively with me. Friends in the sanctuary, I invite you to meditate on the words as I read them. We gather to worship God who creates us and loves us, who gifts us with diversity and makes for us a community, who gives Jesus Christ to show us how to live, who inspires children, youth, young adults, and people of all ages to seek justice, share power, and live together in love and equality, who invites us to join the struggle for wholeness and well-being for all, and whose presence, grace, and love sustain us in our living. We gather to worship God. To God be all glory, honor, and praise. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vote of of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true, where all the children dare to seek to dream God's reign on you. Here the cross shall stand in witness, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here at long we claim the of Jesus, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us be Oh. 
God calls us to live in community. God gives us opportunities and the strength to be the headlights and not the taillights of society, as Dr. King said. Yet in our sinfulness and brokenness, we become separated from one another through the wrongs we commit or allow to happen. But God's forgiveness and grace empowers us to work toward restoring justice for all people. Friends, I invite us now to confess our brokenness first in silence and then together in the community confession. And now for the prayer as printed in the bulletin. Gracious God, we acknowledge and confess our slowness to do good, our indifference to injustice, and our complicity in deferring the dreams and hopes of the oppressed. Forgive us, we pray. Help us to heed your call to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you, with all of you. Exchange with your neighbors a sign of God's peace. Peace be upon you. Good morning, friends. This is Pastor Jack, and this morning I'd like to talk a little bit about Martin Luther King Jr. You may have learned about him in school and at home and hopefully here at church as well. He was a preacher, he was a pastor of a church, and he fought for equality, for the essential dignity of all people. He fought against bad laws that discriminated against people based on the color of their skin. Now, around Martin Luther King Day, many people remember King by remembering certain things that he said things that inspire them. And I'd like to share a quote by Dr. King that inspires me. He said something like, faith means that you don't have to see the whole staircase. You only have to see the first step. Let's test this out, for example, and I'll try not to make you too dizzy as I move, it, move the camera. But here's a step, and here's another step, and here's another step. And we don't see the whole staircase yet. But what we do see, what we can see, is the very next step. So what do you think Dr. King meant by that? I think he might have meant something like this. That it's still important to do the right thing. It's still important to trust in God. Even when we can't see how everything is going to work out exactly we may not be able to see the entire staircase. But we only need to see that first step. We only need to see the first good thing to do. And we can do it. Now, I invite you to talk about this quote some more at home with your parents. And right now, I'd like to close with a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the example of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who fought for the dignity of all people and who continues to inspire us today. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. Join me in the prayer for illumination. Guide us, O oh God. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
The first lesson for today is from Isaiah chapter 53, verses four through six. And for me to understand something in the Bible, it's very helpful to have context. So I'm hoping that for all of you, this context helps you understand what I'm going to be reading to you. Isaiah is a poet in the truest sense of the word. For him, words are watercolors and melodies to make truth and beauty and goodness. Isaiah doesn't merely convey information. He creates visions, delivers revelation, and arouses belief. In the poem that I'm about to read to you from the message, it's from the suffering sermons in which I believe um, the person he, in what I'll be reading to you, is referring to Jesus. So Isaiah chapter 53, verses four through six. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the wrong things with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures, but it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all of our sins everything we've done wrong on him, on him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It's uh, an incredible honor to preach in this inspired congregation and inspired pulpit. Uh, the scripture is uh, from the fourth chapter of Luke, uh, beginning uh, using uh, selected passages and my own uh, interpretation of the passage. Um, let me see, I'm gonna have to find it in here. The fourth chapter, beginning with the first 16 selected passages. When he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read from the prophet Isaiah, another passage of which you've just heard. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. And then he said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and because a prophet is, not, is without honor in his own hometown, the crowd in the sanctuary rose up in fury and ran him out of town. Well, I grew up in a church like the synagogue Jesus grew up in, a fancy church in Buckhead, Atlanta's privileged quarter. Uh, good news to the poor didn't sound like good news to us. Release to the captives to the police chief on the third row sounded like letting criminals out of jail. Recovery of sight to the blind, the ophthalmologist who sat behind us would, thought, would have thought to be quackery. And uh, let, let the oppressed go free. Well, that was exactly what the awful Martin Luther King across town was saying 
to the poor people there. Nobody dared say that in my church. If they had, it would have sent us all into an uproar, me included. My people and I were born in sin, living in sin. Most famous Christian in those days was Billy Graham, who I thought was like Jesus, which means if you think about it, I thought Jesus was like Billy Graham. Billy Graham's preaching convinced me that I was born in sin, living in sin. In time, I came to think of sin as especially our Jim Crow culture, but that was not what Billy Graham said it meant and I wanted to be like Jesus like Billy Graham uh, 10,000 more or less of us lived in Buckhead from uh, in those days in the 1950s some very privileged none were black not one Thousands of black people, though, came to Buckhead every day on the bus, in the back of the bus. Came from the Negro section of town. By, they came to do menial work in menial jobs for menial pay. Buckhead in the 50s was the very definition of Jim Crow. What I liked best in those days was going to Daddy's office on Saturdays with Daddy. I'd sit in the accounting pool and type figures on somebody's adding machine. Uh, and I would pull the crank and roll out the figures down on a spool of paper to the floor. And then I'd go to Daddy's window and look out at the tall buildings downtown. What I didn't look at was across the street, the Negro section, where people came from to, bu to buses to Buckhead in the back of the bus. I could see their church from Daddy's window. Daddy said it was called Ebenezer Baptist. The parsonage of Ebenezer was just two blocks down from the office. The pastor was named for the leader of the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther. His son and namesake lived there too. We didn't know that, didn't care. But the pastor's son grew up and became a pastor himself, Dexter Avenue Baptist in Alabama's capital. I was 15 when I first heard of him, Martin Luther King Jr. I heard of him because a woman in his church by the name of Rosa Parks sat down at the front, not the back of the bus, where she was by law required to sit on their Jim Crow bus. And the black pastors formed the Montgomery Improvement Association. And he, Martin Luther King Jr., being the best educated and the pastor of Rosa Parks and, well, the new kid in town who didn't know any better, was elected president, and they began the Montgomery bus boycott and the transformation of American history. From then on, I feared, I hated Martin Luther King Jr. All I knew of him was carefully edited distortions in Southern Jim Crow media, which never mentioned his PhD from Boston University 
his biblical preaching, the hymn singing of his followers, his biblical preaching, the charisma of his oratory, never his prophetic reasoning or its foundation in Scripture, let alone his compassion for the likes of me. None of that. Just carefully se selected caricatures of a raging, crazy man. Who he really was and would become the seminal theologian of 20th century Christianity, reincarnation of the biblical prophet, prophets, herald of justice, architect with Gandhi of nonviolent social change, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, hero now to two generations across the planet, icon of tomorrow's national holiday, the only American not a president in 250 years to be so honored. Him we could not ever imagine. As Jesus said, no prophet has honor in his hometown. In time, I met him, read his books, books about him, had the incalculable privilege of late night bourbon lubricated conversations with his best friend Ralph Abernathy and other others of the heroes of the movement but that was later I was born into the wake of slavery residual civil war bitterness still redolent reconstruction humiliation cultural limitations of southern journalists, sneering racist conversations. The other passage from Isaiah read in a different translation than this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus knew this poem by heart, engraved indeed on his soul, and was entire, inspired to take it up as his singular ministry, and so with Dr. King. Here's what happened to me. I was 20 years old in a North Carolina college, still Jim Crow, living in sin. Four African-American students in Greensboro, 30 miles away, were on TV news, having illegally sat at a Woolworths lunch counter that reserved the right to refuse service to the, anyone who looked like them. They said on TV that they had been swept up into the hurricane started by Dr. King in Montgomery. And then one said, I can shop at every counter in downtown Greensboro but the lunch counter. And then he said, that isn't fair. Well, something like, that was something that even I, Jim Crow as I was, could understand. For the first time I had to think about it. We talked about in philosophy class, got categories to think about it with. Then a friend invited me to go downtown, meet some students from a black college across town, and do what they did in Greensboro. Without much thought, I went. When we got to Woolworth, the police came. They said we had one minute to leave or be arrested. Arrested. I had not thought of arrested. They hadn't been arrested yet in Greensboro. 
in one minute was not near long enough for me to think about it, so I was arrested for civil disobedience, something I'd never heard of. Arrested for breaking the segregation law and for crossing my families, my churches, my colleges, my culture's reddest line. Ten black students, ten white students herding in the separate but equal paddy wagons and herded off to separate but equal cells in the Winston-Salem City Jail. I had known what I was doing, what I had gotten into, hadn't even, even decided to do it, but was suddenly alienated from literally everyone I loved, my entire cultural and religious landscape. In my terror and confusion, I beat a path to the only one I'd ever heard speak positively about Dr. King. That was Mac Bryan, my religion professor. For the next three months, he became my mentor, taught me who Jesus really was, not a popular evangelist like Billy Graham. No, Jesus was a despised and rejected, compassionate, civil disobedient like Dr. King. Like my first black partners at the lunch counter who were, by the way, the first black peers I'd ever met, even I was swept up into the mo movement of Martin Luther King Jr., the kid down from daddy's office who used to celebrate his birthday on January 15th with his parents and a few friends. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all Dr. King taught his followers the meaning of the gospel he said for his followers to love even Jim Crow's like me. To confront me with the inhumanity of my attitudes, my structures, my laws, and then openly break those laws, call down the fury of those structures, not on, not on me, but on themselves. Don't reciprocate my hatred for them, he said to his followers, but to take my hatred on themselves. Be wounded, not for their own, but for my transgressions. Accept the chastisement of my disturbed peace in a spirit of love. Then, he said, my Jim Crow iniquity will, in the miracle of Jesus, be healed. And so it has. Amen. Thank you all for your generous support of KPC, um, especially in this time when it's so important to support the fact that we can all have a physical home to come to at this church. With gladness, let us present the offering of our life and labor to the Lord by taking your everyday, ordinary life 
you're sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Accept, O Lord, the offering we seek to make of ourselves and our money, and grant that we may ever work and pray to build a world of peace and joy and freedom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, George, for your powerful word to us this morning, for your powerful biblical preaching and for integrating your personal story through all of that. Um, I hope you'll go back and watch the service on Facebook because there are a number of comments uh, on the Facebook live stream offering their thanks to you. And I know that our friends here in the sanctuary are looking forward to giving you a socially distanced thank you and amen as well, amen. At this time, we share joys and concerns in our church family. For friends worshiping on Facebook, I have my comments open on the phone. And I'll, uh, if you have permission to share a prayer request, we'll do that this morning. Uh, friends here in the sanctuary, um, you can text me at the number that's printed in the bulletin if you have a prayer request that you would like to share and have permission to share.
Let us join together in a spirit of prayer. God of all races and nations, we praise you for all your faithful servants who have done justice, loved mercy, and walked humbly with their God. For apostles, martyrs, leaders, and saints, and for humble folk whose names were never in the news but are recorded in your book of life, we give you thanks, O oh God. Especially this day, we thank you for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., for his courage and conviction, for his passion for peace, and for his tireless quest of a nation that keeps faith with its promises. We give you thanks, O oh God. And for countless others who stood in the front lines and marched, integrated schools and restaurants or sat in buses and refused to move, we give you thanks, O oh God. For nameless multitudes who suffered the tortures of slavery and the tyranny of oppression, and for the nameless multitudes today whose lives are stunted and cut short by economic and social structures of brutality. We grieve and promise to work for justice, O oh God. And for children, women, and men of every race who are denied education, health care, jobs, housing, and hope in our land, we grieve and promise to work for justice, O oh God. Hear us now as we offer prayer concerns. Gracious God, we offer thanksgiving for the life of Martha's friend Charlene, who died last year. which was just learned in a Christmas card. So we pray for all those who are grieving, whether that grief is ancient or new. We pray for healing of all those who are suffering from COVID. We pray for safety for the healthcare workers and first responders. And we pray for the surge to end and for the pandemic to become more endemic and less of an interrupter of our daily lives. All these hopes we pray and pour out, O oh Lord, and we remember the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is Lift Every Voice and Sing. Lest 
stars still over the way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of a bright star is cast. God of our forever in the path we press. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadow of Thank you, Penny, for leading our hymns this morning. And I'm sure that we all look forward to that day when we can sing joyfully without fear together here in the sanctuary. And that day is coming. And now, dear friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people, all God's creatures, and all God's creation. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with all of you. Alleluia. Amen.